Hey guys, I'm Bessie Atkins and you are locked into 4-9. In celebration of Black History Month, we have something special for you. Today we have a panel celebrating everything it is to be unapologetically black. And I'm joined by three amazing, beautiful women. My name is Charlotte Mensa. I'm the founder of the Manketi Oil Hair Range. I also have a salon hair lounge. My name is Bianca Williams and I'm a Great British Sprinter. My name is Naomi Nicholas Williams. I'm a plus size model. I'm a body love and mental health advocate. So ladies, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Yeah? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. You know, I feel like because of every single thing that you've been through, like 2020 has been like a year that's ridiculous. Not ridiculous, yeah. but it's been yeah, challenging. It's been yeah. Yeah. a mad one. <laughs> so I feel yeah. like we always ask each other, how are we? But we don't actually answer, how, how are we? Yeah. Yeah. So over the past few years, being black has been celebrated. But this is relatively new. Like, growing up, I didn't really feel like we were celebrated in the way that we are celebrated now. And I want to know what was it like for you guys when you were younger and if you actually thought growing up that black was beautiful? Yes and no. Mm. I feel like it was always a bit of a worry just to say that, like, just to be black. You always had to, like, just be careful what you say, be careful what you do because you're black and people are going to look at you and people are going to, you know, portray you in certain ways. And, um, yeah, I think growing up was just a bit of a weird one. You know, I remember being in secondary school and when it came to, like, Independence Days, it was just <laughs> crazy. You know, everyone would be... Everyone, what was it? The Irish Independence Day. Everyone would be in flags. They'd have green things in their hair. They'd paint their face. But I remember when it was a um, Ghanaian Independence Day and then when, like, the Ghanaian girls brought in the flags, it was a write-off. Like, yeah. they got in trouble, they were told not to be so loud. Wow. Um, and, like, looking back at it now, it's like, oh, my gosh, like, how, how was my school doing that? I was born in the UK in the age of three months. I left to live with my grandparents in Accra, Ghana. So I grew up with everybody being amazing. Like, the doctor was black, the lawyer was black, the judge is black, newsreader's black. So I never really had, from the age of my primary years, I didn't really have any kind of indication that there was a problem because everybody that was around me was black and they were doing well and there was great role models. It's when I came to the UK at the age of 11, coming from Ghana, I just thought everybody black would be Ghanaian because mm. we weren't, I mean, I was at school in primary years. They didn't really teach us slavery or anything. So you didn't know that there were other black people from our need of, of Nigerians, of, Togolese, of Benin, but I didn't even know there was Caribbeans. Mm. So I came in thinking, oh, because you're dark and you're from Ghana. And I did not get that welcome. I was so like alienated. I was like an outsider all the time. So yeah, I never really felt that, I don't know, it just... Yeah. And listening to you, I remember growing up or when I was younger in mm. school, it wasn't cool to be African. No. As in, no way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Nigerian. Yeah. Um, but when I was growing up, I, I wanted to be Caribbean. I wanted yeah. to be Jamaican. My yeah. name was Shaniqua. Mm. Like, literally. <laughs> I'll go to the party, you'll go to the shops and be like, they'll ask yeah. my name. I'm like, sorry, my name is Shaniqua. Yeah. Do you think I'll say Bissy? What? Yeah. No way. I mean, I think it's <laughs> even easier for you guys because I grew up in the 80s. So it was very different. There was very little Ghanaians and Nigerians. It was like maybe 5%. You're talking about 1981. There was hardly, I mean, nowhere near as much as now. And even the Ghanaians and, and Nigerians didn't want to be, yeah. they didn't want to be Ghanaian. It was tough. It was tough. Um, I feel like I did know because my family told me that black was beautiful and that I was beautiful. But at school, I didn't feel it, hmm. um, you know, because there's so much attention on everyone else that isn't black and everything else, even though in spite of that, everyone wants to take bits of black culture. So it's like difficult <laughs> to like find the balancing act when you're growing up and trying to navigate. Yeah. Like, oh, my, my skin is beautiful, but people are telling me it's not, but they want to make comments about my skin, that it's this amazing thing, which it is. I think with my career and taking off and stuff, I think that's helped me. And like shaving my head, for instance, yeah. that's a big thing in the black community. Mm. Like my granddad used to say, your hair is your beauty. Yes. So if he was alive, I'm sure he'd be like, Naomi, I mean, what are you doing? <laughs> um, I'm thankful to my family because they were the ones who like really like told me that I was beautiful. So I know my black is beautiful. I know black people are 
like yeah. stunning. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I love that when we have that foundation ingrained in home, no matter where we go outside, we're always reminded that black is beautiful because yeah. that's what we've been taught. Even if we go into schools or we go into environments and they're like, yeah, no, me, I don't like you because of your hair or because you're too dark. You still know that black is mm. beautiful. Personally, I've had to code switch. Right? So code switching, if you don't like know what it is, is basically you, know, you have to change up who you are a little bit, maybe a lot, to fit into the space that you're in. And particularly in white spaces or working environments. Mm. So maybe, for example, changing my hair and not changing it that often, or not bringing in jollof rice and chicken because it's going to smell up the canteen, and going to <laughs> Tesco to have a meal deal because you don't want people to say, that smells spicy. No, it's just like jollof rice. Um, but code switching is not basically trying to fit into a white environment, it is surviving it. Mm. And has there been any cases where you've had to code switch? And if you have, do you regret it? Yeah, when I first started modelling, like the first like year, I was like, oh, I'm already a big girl, I'm tall, like, I'm, mm. I'm very loud, like, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm not loud, but if I have something to say, I'm going to say it, like, I have a big personality, and I really, like, shrunk myself to, like, oh my gosh, like, I'm here, but I don't want to, like, say anything, I don't want anyone to think anything of me. It, it's difficult, because I had to, like, switch off from who I know that I am organically, um, but once you kind of know that who you are, no one can say anything to you. That's the most powerful thing. Yeah. Once you know yourself, like inside out, nothing anyone says can penetrate. Yeah. You yeah. know? Oh. There's so many different layers to it mm -hmm. and like so many different nuances to it. So it couldn't, it may not be the overt ones in terms of your hair or mm -hmm. the way you dress or the food you bring. But even it the, could way be in the way you speak. speak. I was yeah. just about to say, yes. like when clients would call in from work and they're making appointments, I'd be like, who's this person? Yeah. <laughs> but when they're in the salon and like they're all relaxed and are you? Sorry, the voice is totally different. So do you think that there are black British beauty standards? And if so, where do you see these reflected? When I do a shoe, it's very tokenistic. So it's like, we'll have a mixed race girl, we'll have a dark skinned girl, but we won't have anyone in between. Mm. But it's like, it's not representative. I feel like it's tokenistic. So I think there's a standard of beauty that if you are lighter, that you are a person who is better for some reason, which is absolutely false in like, it's just, it blows my mind. So I think there's a standard, but I think it's being broken. Yeah. Because I think that there are people that are paving pathways to, you know, change that. And I'd like to think that I am one of those people that are doing that, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I want to ask, how important do you feel or how much of a part do the media and advertising and marketing play in the representation, or should we say the underrepresentation of black women? Massive, massive role. Um, even from when I was younger, you'd see like, you know, Pantene and L'Oreal and Herbal Essences, and you've always got that, you know, the white women with their long, luscious, <laughs> silky hair or whatever it is, <laughs> and they're, they're doing all this to it. And it's only now we're seeing, you know, little things that like um, black women are the cover of Vogue or they're doing, you know, hair and beauty magazines. It's only now that it's really like stepping up. It's got, we've got a long way to go before we even make the, the big TV screens. We've got a long mm. way to go, but it's, we're all going to have children and we're all going to have little sisters and cousins mm. that look up to us and look up to, you know, being black and want to see who their next role model is. And mm. if they're not seeing that on the TV or if they're not seeing that on billboards and... Who, who are they going to look up to if it's not us? By the way, I've noticed, maybe it's because we're in Black History Month, but all the all billboards the I'm driving yeah, by, I'm like, everybody is black. I'm like, what? Am I really yeah. in the UK? Okay. Yeah. But which brands do you guys admire that have been properly like, advocating for black representation and black women and, you know, black beauty standards? I feel Dove started it a while ago because oh, they, they will have these they amazing do. adverts of all sizes, all colours, yeah. all, yeah. And I, I felt they've been a good leader. I feel Mac, I remember like, you know, I'd be on holiday in Ghana and they would say, oh, Tate, you know, could you get me the, and I'll be able to get every single person's shade. Mm. Whereas the other brands didn't offer that. I'm gonna pop in and say Fenty. Fenty, yeah, we should come over. Like, I, I was just saying, yeah. what? I could yeah. be like 10 of these shades yeah. and it would still yeah. suit me. I yeah. think she's doing great because she's taking on beauty and lingerie yeah. and she's being inclusive of everyone. everyone. Yeah. And that's what we need to see more of. But I also feel like what I don't like at the moment as well, like I'm all happy about all of the billboards and all the adverts, but it just kind of feel like a trend. 
Mm, it feels yeah, like it's yeah, just, yeah. and that really bothers me. Performative. Of, yeah, of stuff, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I just feel like I don't want it to be a trend. I want it to be, it should be just history. Let's just go with this. It's forever and ever. But do yeah. they really mean it? Yeah. Is it ingrained in them yeah. inside? You know? Yeah. And it's first. like the way <laughs> <laughs> right, they're yeah. down the also, billboard. <laughs> I, I went with uh, my daughter to Edinburgh like two weeks ago. She goes to uni up there and we went into the Marks and Spencers and I'm like, Oh my God, everyone in the shop is black. All the billboard, all the adverts. I'm like, well, where's everybody else? Where's the big woman? Where's the, the short lady? Where's the yeah. Chinese lady? Why is it just black women? On the, it really bothered yeah. me. Like, because I, I was worried. Mm. And Naomi, for you. So there was this huge movement on social media with regards to body positivity, mm -hmm. yeah? And then with the censorship of your topless image on Instagram, Lots of headlines, lots of people campaigning. They yeah. want to see you. They want to see you. <laughs> and you were censored. You were yeah. censored. And what do you feel about like the censorship of the fat black woman? And do you think you are on the right track of things? Or do you think more can be done? Things are happening at the moment. I can't say what. But mm -hmm. I think that it's going in the right way. I think that the fact that everyone rallied behind, but it wasn't for me. And I've, I've said this, it's not just about me. Like, it's about other, it's about black women in general. It's not just about like fat black women, it's about the respect that like black women deserve in general. And we're always censored in some way, shape or form. So I'm glad that, I'm not glad that it happened, but the outcome mm -hmm. and the support, like it feels genuine. Like something feels a bit different. Mm -hmm. Like they're actually reviewing, Instagram are reviewing their policy on how they review semi-nude um, images because of the campaign. Wow. So if they change that guideline, that's gonna be big for everyone. Yeah. Not just like black women, that's just like all women. And I saw in a, a previous interview that you, you did, that you said that basically they gave you the blue tick to shut you up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think they did. I think that they did, because yeah. I definitely do. That's, yeah. that's the, the feeling I got from it. It was like, okay, we've given you your blue tick now, stop talking about it, <laughs> but I'm not the one. Like, I, if I'm passionate about something, like, what's the blue tick gonna do? Like, I'm still gonna yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah. I'm still gonna rub my mouth and I'm still gonna say what I need to say. And Bianca, for you, growing up, I, remember, I grew up in South London. Where did you guys grow up? South London? South, babes. Dunno, dunno, dunno. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I remember all of the ladies that were in sports or were very athletic were either referred to as like mandem, which means like quite masculine, or tonk, but which kind of muscular, <laughs> but they were never referred to as like beautiful first yeah. or pretty first. You know, I went to a girls' school and um, out of like, from year seven to year 11, there was three black girls who were really into sport. And look, looking back at it now, it's like, oh, wow, that's, that's shocking. Mm. But at the time, um, it was worrying to look a certain way. I used to run with like a T-shirt on, on top of my vest because I was like, all right, let's just hide my biceps. But it took me a long while to realise that, do you know what, this is actually so good. Um, firstly, I can run in like a knickers in a crop top. <laughs> and, um, and secondly, my body is absolutely incredible. And now it's just, everybody wants that, that athlete body. Everyone wants to, you know, the abs, the flat stomach, or everyone wants to look strong nowadays. When before it was like, oh, looking strong, it just means that you're, you're gonna have no boobs or yeah. you're gonna just have, you know, a rock hard bum or there's just all these things that would, that were, um, it weren't said to me, like, per se, but were said mm. in, you know, passing distance. But a lot of youngsters that always look up to me and, and say, you know, I want to be like you when I'm older. And, and I always say to them, like, you know, it's OK to, to be strong. Like, you, you have to be strong. What was the moment for you where you realised that you looked at yourself in the mirror and you're just like, Bianca, you're beautiful? I think when I started running well, I think that's when I started to really appreciate my body and, um, and how much my body gives back to me. You know, being strong makes me run faster and I have to be strong in the sport to, um, to win medals. And I think once I started to, to run fast, I was like, do you know what, this is, this is sick. Yeah. I've got such a nice body. And do, you know what, do you know what as well? The pictures you get afterwards. That's it, them track pictures. <laughs> it, it just, it works over the job, really. It's just, it's perfect. That is very, very beautiful. I think deep down I've always known, but I just let outside noise get to me. Mm -hmm. And I think the moment I stopped listening or <laughs> taking on opinions of other people, and then when I started booking like big jobs, like mm. big beauty shoots, 
um, I'd say that was it. <laughs> and even when I think about it, in like the beginning of my hairdressing journey, there was never, all the models were really light skin, long hair. There was never a dark skin girl of my shade. It was always a mixed looking girl. So then you thought, okay, maybe I'm not that color, so I'm not as good. Yeah. And if you didn't have that, as no matter what your parents are telling you, what your friends and family, you don't see it. Yeah. Because yeah. when you're around your friends, you look at magazines. Yeah. There was nobody that looked like you. Yeah. So it made you feel like, well, I'm not part of that. I'm just the outside. I'm not that good. Universally, when you understand that beauty isn't all about the physical. No, definitely not. Yeah. But you learn that later. Yeah. When you're like a teenager. You don't know yeah. that. You don't know that. Don't like, know. you know, people telling you, oh, the beauty is inside you. You're like, what inside what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> this is what people <laughs> see. <laughs> like, yeah, like when you're younger, you, know, you do think that. Even like also in the salon as well, like you get a lot of women that will come in, they're not confident. They walk in, their heads down do their hair two hours later they're walking out there like they're on the catwalk you're like what? and can i just say your hair i've been looking at it i've just been like whoa the length is so luscious and just so oh, full i have i'm actually not i'm growing my hair all out so yeah. it's in its natural state but i have got a few pieces in there as well it's really been celebrated this natural hair journey yeah, nowadays gosh. social media if i'm a naturalista Ooh. natural sister yes yes yeah. yes come on but it wasn't always like this like afro hair was deemed as untamed yeah politics. unprofessional distracted mm. and so many things that wasn't beautiful it wasn't what it is yeah so how has that journey been for you i think just there was just nobody in the space celebrating it and championing mm. natural hair when I set up my salon, I wanted it to all be about you and embracing you and your textures. Everything was against us. It was all about chemically straightened hair, um, lots of weaves, lots of, you know, like, it wasn't anything about embracing your hair. You wouldn't, I mean, I, I remember people coming up to me and say, I actually can't get a job with my natural hair. You know, I turn up in a corporate environment, they'll be like, you cannot work like this, which was quite political. Mm -hmm. People have been excluded from school. I don't know, it's almost like you just don't get anywhere in your life if your hair was natural, but that's what you're born with. So why are we having to yeah, fight? Alter. Yeah, yeah. Why? why are we having to change it? Why are we having to, to alter our natural um, being? It came to a point in 2010 where I decided to, to develop some products. So that came about when I had this great opportunity to visit Serengeti in Kenya from a client's wedding. And I found this oil. It took me six years to develop the oils. And now we're sold in like Netaporta, Space wow. and K. And it's been great. I mean, we've won over 17 awards. We started with three products. We now have nine. Wow. And yeah, hopefully, you know, there was a time where people were like, it's only wigs that's in. I'm like, no, not in this salon. You can have wigs too. <laughs> not here, B. Yeah. <laughs> you can have wigs too, but let's, let's really work on our hair. Let's, mm. let's love our hair. Yeah. Let's really appreciate who we are and honor it. Because I felt like all of those images just, you know, sort of led us to abuse our hair. Because yeah. I meet so many young people they come and sit in my salon. I'm like, why have you got any hair? You're 22. Listen. And the the hairline is like, listen. And they, it breaks my heart. I was so shocked. Ten year olds wearing wigs. I'm like, you're oh. 10. Why wow. are you wearing? Wigs? Wow. It was sad. Oh. It was so sad. That's shocking. That shocking. Is... I was traumatized. It was a boarding school, and they they were just like. Oh, it's just easier to do the wig and not. I said, it's not. At, at your 10. age, I said, even no. if you've got three inches hair, I'll just. Just put in two twists. What, what is this big deal about long hair and curls and, so, you know, it's very hard to look like Beyonce. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't look like Beyonce all the time anyway. <laughs> she has a whole crew that sets her up. She's yeah. got a room full of wigs as well. <laughs> so much weight, and I think we touched on it earlier, that there's so much weight and emphasis put on hair in terms mm. of just how beautiful it is and how yeah. it's your crown and yes. you should water it. So Naomi, for you, mm. you are a beautiful black woman with very, very low hair. Like, yeah. you, what was that journey in terms of just like doing the big chop for you? I did so much with my hair. Mm. I'm surprised I have a hairline. Like, <laughs> I'm not even joking. Like, I did so like throughout my school life, college, I did wigs, I mm. glue ins, I ripped yeah. out my hair with bonding glue. Oh my gosh! Like, 
you can be beautiful in spite of having hair or not. Exactly. Um, and it's again, it's not about. I don't think it's just about your face or your physical. Mm. It's about who you are. Mm. So I hope that I emulate beauty, mm. not just because my hair is short or because of my face, but because of who I am. Yeah. So I wouldn't. I can't imagine having hair now. Sure. I mean, I'm gonna get yeah, some hair because nice. my head gets cold. <laughs> <laughs> But I love being bold. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. So Naomi Osaka and Serena Williams are always getting like slack for their hair choices when it comes to work or while they're working environments. Bianca, have you had any slack or have you received any of that for the hair choices that you choose to, you know, choose while you're running? You know what? I haven't. Um, I'm surprised that I haven't, to be honest. Um, but it's, it is sad to know that other sportswomen are getting, you know, um, told that they they should change their hair or their hair is not making them pretty or um, yeah it's just sad that they're getting that abuse. I like how you defined it as a, it abuse, is abuse because some people would be like no it's not abuse but it actually it is. Is. It is. When I did have hair there was never anyone that knew how to do my hair or to put any the products that I needed in it so that's very frustrating to not have anyone to do it and for it to be like comments made like oh like when I had like little afro um someone said to me like oh your hair's really um your curls are really like loose like i'd expect them to be like quite mm. tight, tight curls mm. i was like <laughs> yeah. i literally took everything in me i was like was that comment necessary mm. and not every black person's hair is the same, same and yeah. every black person's hair is lovely so the way you mm. phrased that was that my hair was better than someone else's because it wasn't my curls weren't as tight as someone else's mm. yeah. so it's those things that I, I find to be really like rude and yeah. frustrating. Yeah, even for me, like before I started like presenting, I was working in the corporate world. I was working like in a grey, dingy office somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and like you said earlier, I think you said it so brilliantly that um, your hair is like a canvas mm -hmm. and you can choose to curate, cur curate yeah. whatever you want. Yeah. And listen, I change my hair every, every day, B. <laughs> yes. If it's a braid or style yeah. or a wig style yeah. or the colour, I'll be yeah. changing my hair because yeah. I can. Yeah. And in the office, I'm at the same desk. Mm. I'm at the same computer. I'm the same everything. Same performance. Oh, busy, mm. you look so different. <laughs> and I'm like... Oh boy, like it's me. So yeah. It's so, and it will be a point of conversation mm. all yeah. the time. Like, you just look so different. This isn't that. Can I touch your hair? I'm like, no, no. B, you can't. Oh, that yeah. question. Like, you really yeah. can't. <laughs> you and I know sometimes I feel like they don't mean any bad by it at all. Yeah. But just the fact that it's a conversation or a point of topic when you're having tea break or coffee break, I'm like, mm. it's not that serious. I'm mm. still the per same person. Yeah. I'm actually still at the same desk. So yeah. just because you're I decided to go. To your hair. Mm. Like, I know that when I used to wear weaves and like when I had hair, it was because I wanted to fit in. And this was before I knew mm. how like incredible I was having my natural hair and having now no hair. Because mm. I like what, eight years ago, if you told me my hair would be like bald now, I would have laughed in your face because mm. all I knew was <laughs> literally weaves. weaves. But it was like, I had to address the, the reason why yeah. I was changing my hair. Not because I wanted to, because I wanted people to be like, oh, like your hair looks really nice. Oh, and just, for the wrong reasons, mm. not because I liked my own hair, but because other people were yeah. saying, oh, it looks really nice. Like, mm. it's just Seeking you. that validation. Yeah. 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 So, so it's, yeah. it's like an attention seeking. Yeah, yeah. But... Unintentional. Yeah, unintentional. It's like subconsciously. Mm. Just like, but now, when, once you grow out of that, it's like, it's the best thing ever. And recently, yeah. Adele really faced a lot of backlash mm -hmm. for culturally appropriating <laughs> the Bantu knots that yeah, we spoke about yeah, earlier. Yeah. Right? Wait, you're giving me a straight face. <laughs> no, no. Sorry, the Caribbean me is just like... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was very diverse. Like people, mm. Some people were like on the spectrum where she's celebrating Notting Hill Carnival. Yeah. Um, and then other people were like, nah, B, you wouldn't wear this to the Grammys or you wouldn't do your hair like mm, this yeah. or all these things. Yeah. What did you, Naomi, I'm going to come to you first. What did you yeah, think, how on. did you feel when um, you saw the picture of Adele I, in the Jamaican bikini top with the feathers the and okay. the Bantino? Being of Caribbean descent, I attend carnival and wear costumes every year. So mm. everyone wears the, you know, you have the mm. flags and yeah. Yeah, all of that stuff. But I think with the Bantino knots, 
how is she able to, what annoyed me the most was how is she able to wear it and people are like admiring her and saying like she's incredible yeah. for doing it and so revolutionary when we are not able to do so. That was what irked me the most. And you can celebrate someone's culture without having to go to the extent that she did. Yeah. Like wear your bra, but have your hair out. Mm. Like do your thing, like wear the wings. Like carnival, the thing about like black culture is that we're very inclusive. Mm. So carnival is for everyone. Mm. It's for us to celebrate ourselves, but we're like, come, everyone come and join. Like it's so multicultural because the UK is, you know? Mm. But I just feel like that was a step too far for me personally, because we are stopped from doing so much to our hair mm. and are not allowed to do things. And there's like microaggressions, all, all sorts of things. And she's able to just literally be like, happy carnival everyone. Mm. And everyone's like, oh my God, it's so amazing. And it's so revolutionary. It was quite similar. Do you remember when Kim Kardashian had her hair in like the oh, Dutch braids? braids yeah. And, that? and then all of a sudden that was a thing. But black people have been doing it for such so long, so long. Yeah. but would never get the credit for it. So I just looked at it like it was carnival, it's pandemic, you can't go to carnival. And um, I think she's dating a Jamaican guy as well. So she felt like, oh, do you know what? <laughs> I'm part of this whole um, culture. Let me. Um... And she's lost a lot of weight. So there's a lot of things going on here. So she felt very empowered to show this new figure. And like, I mean, I've never seen a doll like that. It's like a complete new person. It's like night and day, isn't it? Yes, yeah, completely. <laughs> She's at night and um, yeah, I think I didn't, for me, what gets me um, very worried is the fact that the best soul singer to come out of the UK is a white girl, which is, I find that more yeah, yeah. disturbing than the actual hairstyle. Alexandra Burke must have tweeted something, that put on mm. Instagram. Mm. Uh, a couple of months ago about how um, in the, being in the X Factor, she had to like literally down herself, herself down yeah. to, um, to come across well. You know, mm. there were certain things that she would do that were normal, but yeah, then but it people would say that you're, you're being too aggressive. Like, mm. why are you being like that to, mm. to people? And that's literally how it is being a black person yeah. compared to a white person. A white person. Like, that's just, you know, yeah. even in um, athletics, you know, if you're white, then, oh, wow, you're fantastic. But if you're black, oh, yeah, of course, you're always going to run fast. Yeah. You know, it's, oh, it's in your genes. Because you know? you're black. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Just... Bianca, you experienced some racial profiling this year that got a lot of media attention. Um, how has that impacted your family and yourself? It impacted me a lot, really. Um, so it ha happened on a Saturday and... Um, Literally, since then, I've all, I'm always looking to see if I'm being followed. I'm always looking to see if the police are going to follow the, my car um, or my partner's, like whoever's driving. I'm always looking mm. to see if the police are going to follow. Um, I'm always weary now. Like I never really used to be before, but I'm I'm very weary. But you know, we're, we're doing we're doing well. Um, my son's great. I feel like because I have a platform. I feel like it was right for me to speak out. It was right for me to, to let other people know that it does happen to, it can happen to anyone. Mm. Um, and I feel like I needed to be a voice and an advocate for people who don't have um, a voice, who are unable to speak up or who are scared to speak up. Mm. I had so many messages um, from mothers, sons, everybody um, saying that, you know, they've known people that have been stopped in a certain way. Like, thank you for speaking up and thank you for, having a voice that, you know, thank you for doing something that we couldn't do. Yeah. But then you do get the average Joes that are just like, oh, you know, you're this, you're that, you know, mm. you just get a lot of nasty people alongside it. And that, that comes with, you know, the benefit of speaking out and yeah, yeah, having a voice really. Voice, yeah. yeah. And I understand like, you know, when celebrities say like, we need to ban trolling, mm. I am f I'm for it now. Mm. I never really used to be before, maybe because mm. it never it never affected me, but yeah. but now I've been a victim of trolling and I still am to be honest. Mm. And it's it's sad, it's nasty. Restrict like, yourself. I've restricted yeah. I've restricted my comments, I restricted my DMs. You no one to. can reach me. I'm not to. I'm not doing it. Because mm. it made me it made me sad. It got yeah, to a yeah. point where at night, you know, I should be sleeping. My son's gonna wake me up in like the next two hours, but mm. I'm there scrolling through Twitter to see what people are saying about me. And wow. it was just like it became a habit. Like I yeah. had to see That's what it. people are saying. Yeah. And I don't know why. It made me feel crap afterwards, mm. but I wanted to to know what people were saying about me. Yeah. And I wanna ask each of you. What words would you give anybody that's listening to this conversation or watching it and they're still on their journey to finding themselves or their identity of what it is to be truly beautiful? Be patient with yourself and take time. Don't rush anything. Like, don't rush any form of process. I don't try and rush or overthink anything. 
You just have to believe in yourself. I always f feel like um, it's like a flame inside you. And if you let other people have a go at you and, you know, they will burn that, you know, you need to keep that fire burning all the time. Well, I think just to have patience, you know, life goes so fast and, and it goes so quick and you only have one, like you can't, you can't go back and change anything. To just have patience and, you know, to allow yourself to grow and enjoy it, you know, like you have to enjoy life, you really do, because you don't want to be living such a sad life and then look back however many years later and, and regret it. Yeah. Like you just... Yeah, just, yeah. Just take time with mm. it, keep the fire burning. Just That's okay. it. It's true. Yeah. And there's some words. It's poetic justice or something. something. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's honestly been so amazing speaking to you amazing ladies. And I just want to say a huge thank you for everyone that has been watching in too. I hope that you've enjoyed this unique special with 4-9 celebrating Black History Month for the unapologetically black panel. Um, my name is Bissy Atkins and yeah, we will just see you sometime soon. Thank you guys so much and peace out.